Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. You ever thought, I need a better way to lead my people and think better about finding the right people and taking good care of them? Well, what's the difference between staff management and team leadership? Well, today, a great mentor of mine, Dr. Jim McKee, comes on and does a great job to help us think better. Is it staff management or is it team leadership? Please listen to this. I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. One of the hardest things of ever running a dental practice is employing great people and thinking well about it. You know, do I call them staff or do I call them team? Well, today we're, in a, we're going to decode the whole conversation with a great friend of mine, great mentor, Dr. Jim McKee. And the topic is, is it staff management or team leadership? Jim, thanks for being on, brother. Always a treat to be with you, Kirk. Thanks so much. How are you? I am fantastic. Now, for those of you listening, you have to know this. Go back and listen to some previous podcasts with Jim. Jim has always been a great mentor. He, I mean, I, mean, I, I told this to him before we hit the go button. Every single time I have a conversation with Jim, my life gets a little bit better. He helps me think a little bit better. And he told me his magic question, which I'm not going to share right now. When it comes to a crossroads with a team member, which we'll share later in the podcast. But Jim, let's talk about this. Why is this such an important topic? Well, you know, it, it's probably the challenge that's the greatest for most of us who own dental practices. We never really had a lot of training in it. When you're managing people, it can be confrontational. That always raises the stress level. And quite frankly, we're busy trying to prep teeth, trying to get good scans, trying to explain things to patients. Managing staff members or team members, depending upon how we think about them, is just another brick in the wall that quite frankly, we're not good at and we don't like doing. Mm -hmm. The problem is, as a business owner, when you look at your profit and loss statement, it's the largest percentage of money going out the door is going to the people that work for you. So early in my career, I realized that I could either try to avoid it, but as a practice owner, that probably wasn't a very logical approach given the amount of resources that are devoted to that for every dollar that comes in the door. So I decided to embrace it because in reality, what that becomes now is an investment in your practice, not an expense, but really it's an investment in your practice. And I will tell you without a doubt, when I look back at the numbers part of my practice, the numbers were always the best when I had well-trained staff members, team members. It allows you to practice at a more effective level. But, you know, we talked last time about the restorative diagnostic practice model. To be able to have a team that you can work with and gather the diagnostic models, gather the diagnostic photographs, put together the joint imaging, send the correspondence, those people are a critical part of your success. So staff management is kind of the old term or it's an autocratic where you're the boss and they are the servants. That's not what it's like today. I think today it's team leadership. I don't think people want to be managed. We want to lead. We want to create excellence in our practice. That's what I think we have to think about today in terms of staff or team, really leadership, 
And I think if we do that, the dividends are just remarkable in terms of what you can do in your practice. And you end up enjoying going to work a lot more. Amen, brother. Stress levels go down. Stress levels go down. They do. They do. Now, if you're listening carefully, Jim's changing the way we think. And this is important. Number one, you said don't look at your you know, compensation costs as a cost. They're an investment. You're investing in human beings. And that's a really hard thing to do. But once you do it, you're like, that was a brilliant change. The second one is all of us, you know, here at Act Dental, I was telling Jim before I hit the go button, like if I use the word staff around here, my team would kill me. You're like, because it's a very intentional use of words. Staff is an infection. It's not a person. So now I'm 53 years old. So like I, it's practice. I, I even catch myself saying the word staff. So if you're listening to this and you're older like me, you're going to catch yourself saying staff. And it's one of those things you can go, okay, um, team, because staff, and I was telling Jim this in Webster's Dictionary, the definition of staff says this, it's the personnel who assist a director in carrying out an assigned task. Now, in the same dictionary, the definition of team player is someone who cares more about helping a group or team to succeed than about his or her individual success. So it's a really important way of changing the way you think. What else do we need to consider, Jim? Ultimately, to lead people, as opposed to managing people, I think ultimately we have to think about four things. First is I think we have to recognize that every person who works for us is gonna bring strengths and they're gonna bring weaknesses. And that includes us as the business owners as well. The goal is to try and accentuate the positive and try to limit the negative things that people bring to the practice so they can't hurt them too badly. Now, what that means is I didn't do that when I was young because I treated everyone the same. What I started to realize is if I can tailor my expectations for the people who work with me based upon their strengths and I can recognize those, they can have a better experience in the practice and the practice will ultimately be more efficient. What that means is you have to be able to be okay with the things that they don't bring to the table. And that's hard sometimes because sometimes those are deal breakers. Yeah. So ultimately the decision is always kind of a tightrope. And that's again, with everyone in the practice. As a team leader, if we can make sure we can put those people who work for us in a position to succeed, it works well for them. And then again, it helps the practice and ultimately it helps that patient have a good experience in the practice. The problem is when the tipping point gets to be on the wrong side. And that's what brings stress to the dentist because at that point, there's a decision to be made. Either what you're going to do is you're going to make a change and you're going to bring someone else into the practice, which can be a stressful discussion, or you're going to tolerate a change in the culture of your business. That's, that's the strain that as dentists we feel. And at some point when the culture becomes too changed or it loses what you really believe in, that's when you have to make a change at the employee level. Yeah. My goal is always not to make any change at the employee level until I, I really don't think that there's any other way back. So I'm going to give everyone the benefit of the doubt as much as I can. But on the other hand, at some point you have to realize that at some point we have to move on. We'll talk about that at the end. Okay. Now any, go back any to thoughts? this. Yeah, I'm in a full sweat right now as you're describing this because this is one of the hardest things you ever do. You know, you take on this responsibility and then if you're a wuss like me, you don't say anything. Your People come to you and they go, how am I doing? You go, you're doing great when they're not doing great and it doesn't help the situation. Walk us through this. Why is this such an important fork in the road? 
everyone doesn't, everyone tries to avoid conflict. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, depending upon your personality style, most personalities are averse to conflict. There are some people that thrive with conflict, but most people don't. So generally we live with something until it becomes too conflicted and that's when the pot boils over and the lid flies off and there's tears in the office and someone slams the door and leaves and everyone's stressed out and the patients are thinking, who's running this practice? Right. That's, that's the hard part. Right. That's the hard part because most of the time we let it go too long. Yeah. That's the issue. Now, let's because we don't, because we don't want to, we don't want to address it. Yeah. It's easier, it's easier to live with the problem than it is to have the hard conversation sometimes. Right. Now, like just like any dental condition, health condition, culture condition, we're going to talk about when it goes too far and too long. But there are some things that you did in your career to preemptively address some things. You mentioned, you know, the whole thing about team meetings on a weekly basis, finding. Can you talk about the methodology of how you thought? You know, I got to tell you that. I started having staff meetings many, many years ago based upon a recommendation from Pete Dawson. And they weren't really staff meetings. Really what they were was team training. And basically, I would put together a presentation and I would give the presentation. And then the next week, I'd have to put together another presentation. And after a couple months, I felt like I was saying the same thing over and over again. I was getting bored listening to myself. (laughs) So I said, I need to change the format. So what we started doing was something called the review preview. You review last week's schedule, what worked well, what didn't work well from a scheduling perspective, from a case presentation perspective, from a financial perspective, anything in the office. So what it allows you to do is to go back and review the week and tweak your systems. Because most of the time we don't do that because if we don't leave time to do this, we're busy prepping teeth, we're busy talking to patients. This is our administrative time with the people that work for us. So what we did is we went through our business and we said, here's what went well last week. Here's what okay last week. Here's what we need to change from last week. Then we previewed the next week. Who's coming in? Why are they coming? What consultation is happening here? Do we have all the implant parts ready for this case? And basically what that became then was our checklist. And from that, there was a delegation list that was now put together. And my job was not to have JM next to anything on the list. (laughs) Seriously. Why not? So, Because I didn't (laughs) want to carry the monkey. Right. That's why you have people working for you because you have other responsibilities. And quite frankly, as long as they have been trained well, if they can do it as well or better than you can, then let them do it so you can devote yourself to other responsibilities that you have. Right. It really became a time management issue. It really became a, a life balance issue so that I could get out of the office on time so I could get home to see Lisa and the kids. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, that was really part of the driving force of it because you see so many dentists who aren't getting home on time and it becomes a strain in their personal lives. Yeah. So the goal is come in, be on time, leave, be on time, and in the middle, be efficient. So the first part of the staff meeting was review, review, preview. It was an awesome way to do it. And then we had left two hours for it. Lunch was before at noon. We had the staff meeting from one until three. There's a little Dairy Queen next to us. So I send people out for Dairy Queen and we come back and we go to work. Then we did a lightning round. If you remember the old password game and used to be on TV, each staff member could bring up one topic non-compensation based and 
there would be a seven minute discussion. Could be clinical, could be managerial. As a dentist, you can talk about anything for seven minutes off the cuff. And what it did, it allowed people to ask questions, a lot of times on topics that I would have never even thought to talk about. So it was really a very team driven discussion where they got to have a better understanding of things because there's, there was never a shortage of questions, I'll tell you that. And most of the time it was the clinical team asking about managerial discussion points and it was the managerial team asking about clinical discussion points. So it ended up being unexpectedly a nice way to cross train the staff. And that two hours, it flew. I mean, really, it was, you could use that for projects too, if you wanted to. So maybe if you got a new piece of equipment, you got a new internal scanner, you got a new CT scanner, you could leave some training for that. But what it does, it allows you to have time with the staff where you're not with patients. And now you can really invest in the people that work for you. Yeah. For me, it was a it was a fabulous two hours every week. I had, a, I had a dentist who kind of was giving me a hard time about it and said, why would you burn two hours of production doing that? I said, do you know how much the numbers were influenced the rest of the week by those two hours? Yeah. When you looked at the numbers, it wasn't even close. Totally. I mean, serious. So it just made perfect sense, not only from a business perspective, but from a staff ma team management stat team leadership development to be able to put that time together and to make it work. Um, so that's kind of how it worked. Yeah. Yeah. I always say, you know, would you rather fly with a pilot who does maintenance in the air or somebody who actually does maintenance on the ground? When you land your practice for two hours a week, you are fixing so many things before they happen. It's, it's really why we had very little staff turnover. Um, it gave me a chance to address things early. So therefore, when I said before that everyone avoids conflict, the earlier you can avoid, the earlier you can address it, generally the less conflict there is. Right. Conflict becomes when this starts to build up and now it becomes a problem. So allowing that to try and get to it earlier in the, in the process made the discussions easier. So let's talk about that. There, you have never, you know, nobody has this perfect career where there's no conflict. Conflict would come up for you. And you mentioned this. In your weekly team meetings, you always found a way to point out something that was do, be doing, be de, being done right. And when conflict happened, when things weren't being done right, you didn't talk about that publicly with everybody. How would you address that? I heard something and I, can't, I wish I could remember where I heard it. And it was, I think at a Seattle study club symposium meeting it was a non dentist who was talking about managing the people who work for you. He said, find something they do right. Because most of the time people who are in a superior position talk to the people who work for them when they do something wrong. Right. So it became really easy to find something they do right. On the other hand, when you did that, I would like to, so every morning we'll go over our cases before the patients come in. We'll open up the PowerPoints. The photography's nice. I'll say to Aloysia, so my assistant, I said, awesome job on the photography. Now, if it's something that is on the other side of the coin, Generally, what I tried to do was to not talk about that publicly. No one likes to be hung out to dry in front of the people they work with. So I would kind of pull them aside, find a moment where it'd be just the two of us and say, here's an issue we need to talk about. And ultimately, it always boiled down to usually a systems discussion, something that in the system that we had developed wasn't being done. So the system was starting to break down. That's really what team leadership is. It's about systems. So as a business owner, if you can create the systems in your practice, then all of a sudden when something gets off the rails, 
just go back to what the system is and figure out where the deviation was. So those conversations I would want to have less publicly. Um, and the reality is if you have to start having those more often with the same patient, with the same person that's working for you, then you start have to start thinking about things in a little bit of a different way. Okay. You know, let's go, let's go there too. Well, here's the problem. The problem is you only have so much bandwidth you can devote to this. Right. And when someone starts taking all the bandwidth and now you don't have time to make clinical decisions, don't have time to treat and plan cases because you're having to manage a situation that you really shouldn't have to manage, then I think it becomes a distraction. You know, my good friend, Mike Casey, who's a retired orthodontist said now, ultimately when that happens, people are stealing from your family, not financially, but emotionally because it's too much of a drain to be able to manage that level of conflict. So I started a long time ago when I, when I had a situation that I didn't think was gonna work out, ultimately I'd have a one-on-one -on -one with, the, with, the with the team member and say, are you happy here? And almost universally, I don't think I've said it where someone said yes. I said, then we got to find a place where you can be happy. I said, let's think about how we can make a transition. I said, I'll support you for a reasonable amount of time until we can find something. Um, sometimes I would have them, I would just end the situation and give them a severance so they could get some time to get on their feet. Um, I never wanted to leave anyone high and dry. That wasn't the point of it. That wasn't the culture and the practice, quite frankly. So that wasn't what it wasn't what it was about. It was more of a fit that wasn't working. And really when it takes away again, so much bandwidth, you only have so much energy that you can devote to this. You know, owning a practice and having a busy restorative practice that you're dealing with, there's decisions that have to be made every day nonstop. If someone is taking up too much of that time, other things suffer. Right. That's so powerful, Jim. I love that. Are you happy here? It's just kind of a, a line in the sand. And yeah. it, it, it's so powerful because a lot of times you go, you know, oh, you're, you're not doing your, you're not, you go on all these tangents, but that's really the essence of all of it, right? And if they say, yes, I am happy here, then I say, then here's what we need to do to make sure we're both happy here. Ah, very well said. Very you can well very said. well, you can set the boundaries as, as loose or as tight as you want them. Yeah. Now, can I ask you, I'm going to ask you to share this story too. We're talking about staff management sure. versus team leadership. You were having dinner with Frank Spear a little a few weeks ago, and he shared a story. I'm sure he wouldn't mind that you share the same story because um, it's a powerful, you know, representation of what we're talking about in this context. You know, it's interesting. I've been so fortunate to get to know Frank over the last six or seven years teaching out at Spear. Frank is like so many of the great teachers, like, Pete Dawson, John Coyce, everyone. He can tell a story like anyone. He was telling a story about he was out to, he goes out, went out to dinner with Lloyd Miller every year in Chicago during the Restorative Academy week. Lloyd was a dentist who taught at the Pink Institute for a long time, practice and had wonderful ethical standards in dentistry, one of the true leaders of that generation. Um, and Lloyd said something to Frank as a mentor and said, you know, especially for people in those high level positions, like those lectures that ultimately you don't have to be a chess speeder your entire career for everything. And it really, I thought was a, a strong message to choose the things you're good at. And if you choose to be in the education world or consulting world, share those things with people who want to hear it as, as effectively as you can. And it was, it was a neat story to hear. So. Yeah. 
it resonates with me because um, I'll just use a Jim Collins quote that I love. It's, you know, a level four leader tries to get people to follow them. A level five leader encourages people to follow a cause, which is bigger. And when, once I heard that, I'm like, that is so much better than what I've been trying to do for all of these years. I don't want anybody to follow me. I want to support them in following a purpose, a cause. And that's a big change of things, you know? So I told Lisa and I have two kids and the kids would laugh if they were hearing this. I say, basically, everyone pulls the rope at a different time. And that's what it is when you, when you understand a cause and you buy into it, you're going to work harder at some times and other times you're going to need support from the people that work with you. That's the beauty of having a team. So that's why I think that in the restorative diagnostic practice model, team leadership is a key component to it. And without it, quite frankly, it's hard to, to have that practice model be as successful as it can be. On the other hand, if you can create a staff like that, sky's the limits. Again, it allows you to have a really compact office or you can add modules to it. But again, it's a nice way to build a practice with a relatively low overhead and it's a fun way to practice. Yeah. Can I ask you this? Because you get a chance to work sure. with a lot of amazing dentists all over. I get sure. these questions. And so I'm going to pass this quick, but Jim, you don't understand. Like I got this team of people, you know, everybody wants more money. They're all entitled and you hear all this stuff. You can't find good people out there. You hear all of this. I'm sure when you're out at Spear, people tell you this. What do you say? All the time. This is going to be a corny answer. Mm -hmm. I think you got to be the person who brings the energy to the office. Yeah. I think the dentist, I think you, there, there's an old saying that I heard from my buddy, Jimmy Cassidy, the fish rots from the head down. Yeah. It starts at the top. If you walk in the door and you're excited to be there and you're willing to share information and you start the day that way, most of the time people are going to self-select in or self-select out. Most of the time they're going to self-select in because especially if they've worked in other practices in dentistry, this is a far more engaging style of practice. And for us, for a team member, it's a way more fulfilling position than simply being a staff member somewhere who does a lot of suction. Yeah. It's a, it's a different level. And when you get the right person, it works really well. Here's the key though. If you have a restorative diagnostic practice, the likelihood is you will be able to generate enough income so that you can pay staff members more than anyone else in your community. So right off the bat, you're, you're taking from the top as opposed to trying to develop from the bottom. You can do it either way and I've done it both ways. But the more mature I got in practice, the more I just hired the best people out there for the most at the highest level in the community. Again, the relative amount of money you're talking about is a small percentage when you look at your spreadsheet. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth. So, but again, that means there's high expectations. If they're getting, they know they're getting, they know they're getting more than they get somewhere else. I had this conversation with the person who works in front in our office the other day. She goes, I know I couldn't get anywhere else, anything more than I'm getting here. Yeah. So all of a sudden now people feel compensated, they feel respected, and they're willing, I think, to follow a cause more than someone who's at the low end of the, of the pay scale and maybe isn't ready for the commitment that you may be looking for in your practice. Totally agree with you. You know, and back to the whole, like, question dentists give us, nobody wants to work. Yeah. I always say, nobody wants to work for you. Like, you got to be somebody that they want to work for. And then the other thing I, I was going to say is, um, people don't- You're pretty leave. hard. Here. I know. 
Well, I'm getting older now. <laughs> and and please, if you're listening to this, I say this with love because if you get this, <laughs> part of the problem in the world, and let me just go there. So please, please hear this the right way. Our job is not to make you feel bad in a podcast. We just want to point out the real problem. The real problem is, is we need leaders. You know, dental team members don't leave practices. No dental team member has ever left a dental practice. They've left a person. They never say, oh, I didn't like the practice. No, there was somebody, there was people, there was a leader there that they didn't like. So I think that's one of the things. And if you can get your brain around this, like if I can become a leader that people believe in, I'm consistent, I do the right thing, I'm organized, I have a coach, I have all this stuff. I'm, I'm slow with how I respond. I think about things. I do a two hour team meeting to train my team members. You're going to have people that want to stay with you for a long time and fight for the cause. So I want to give you some perspective. Like once you start to do this, you see its rewards and you see its impact on your life, your family and everything. It makes it fun going to work. Don't you think? I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. You know, it's, it's a really fun way to practice. Patients notice it. Patients comment on it. Um, I, I absolutely believe my case acceptance is influenced by the fact that my that patients see how well our staff or our team does on a regular basis. So I mean, yeah, I think it's it, it all ties together. So it makes it a lot of fun. Yeah, Jim, this is always great stuff. I would love to keep you the whole day, but I know I can't. Give us some final thoughts on staff management versus leadership. You know what? Don't be intimidated by it. Embrace it. If it's not the right mix, it's not the right mix. That's okay. It can be a soft landing. The, I always tried to avoid a hard landing. Mm -hmm. It was too much stress for me. It was too much stress for the person. That wasn't what I wanted. I had a couple hard landings early in my career. And I, I didn't like the feel of that. So if I knew it was coming, I eventually would create a situation to make it a soft landing. Sometimes that can be a problem though. Because if you make it too soft a landing and it takes too long, the other team members start to get a little bit irritated. Yeah. So you lose some credibility with the solid team members because you're avoiding a problem with someone who might need to have a change in the office. So don't let it go too long. That would be my first thing. Second thing is, you know what? Most people want to do well at their job. All we need to do is support them. The problem is we don't train very well. Every practice should sit down and basically, this was an old Pete Dawson trick, do looping, where they write down everything related to every position in the office. Front desk, answering the phone, making deposits, submitting insurance, emergency, all that stuff. And then make an outline and figure out how all that languaging should be handled. That's the job of the dentist. So. If we really want to have a team that functions on a really high level, if we can provide that for them, then it's an easy way to sit down and have a discussion and say, here's what we need to do. And what that also allows you to do then is to have a very logical performance review, because if there's a list of things, I'll ask them to rate themselves on a scale of one to four. And then I'll rate them on a scale of one to four and we can compare. It's a great way if they think they're doing a two and I think they're doing a four, it's an easy way for me to say, good job. If they think they're doing a four and I think they're doing a one, that's an easy way to have a discussion based upon whatever you have to have a discussion on. But if you have that ahead of time, it's a very objective way to do that process. The other thing that that can do then is lead to, a, to um, a timeline list. Every month, every week, every day, every three months, every six months, all that stuff, computer backups, compressor, changing track, you know, all the stuff that needs to be done to maintain the office. 
And then that can simply be put on a calendar. So it's all systems. That's what I mean. It's if you can create systems in your practice to manage the people who work for you, your job becomes easier. So I guess those would be my two closing comments. I love it. I love it, Jim. And, you know, when you listen to somebody who has done this for as long as you have and has great thinking, I'm telling you guys, these are great tips to help you think better about those great people that support the cause that you're creating. Now, Jim, if I want to learn more about what you do, go out to Spear Education. I know you have a great study club. Can you tell us about both? What is Spear Education? If I've never been, where do I start? And then you got this cool study club. Can I come? Can I join? What is it? Spear Education um, is a great teaching center in Scottsdale. Um, we're really moving back to campus now. So it's, we've got a lot of new campus offerings. Um, I specifically teach the advanced occlusion workshop. It's a three-day workshop. And it's really, it's a, it's a treatment planning, diagnostic, restorative, orthodontic, orthoda- orthodontic, airway discussion based upon what's happening at the tooth level as well as the joint level. Um, you'll learn how to look at MRIs, you'll look at learn our CBCTs, you'll learn treatment planning. It'll, it'll, it's a great three-day program if you're looking for something like that. Chicago Study Club is a program that meets twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall in Chicago. And there's probably 35, 40 people in there. And it's by invitation only. So we do talk to people before they get in to, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. It's an elite group of dentists who are looking at this on a higher level. We bring people in as speakers where we had a really cool program coming up next March. We're going to do our next May. We're going to do a table clinic day. We're going to have ExoCAD design. We're going to have 3D printers. We're going to have MRI reads, CBCT reads, treatment planning stations. It's really going to be an awesome couple of day meeting. Um, and then we have a meeting in October too, where we're going to bring the speaker in, but we haven't figured out who yet. Um, so it's an, it's an awesome study club. If you want more information, um, you can email me at Jim at McKee DDS and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. And other than that, it's just another day, uh, doing it again. Buddy, you're the best. As always, you add so much value to our listeners, to the community, to this great profession. So, Jim, I'm so grateful, buddy. Um, Stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show podcast. This is good stuff. Like, you got to understand, our goal is to bring great information from great speakers, great thinkers, great clinicians, so that you can create a better practice and a better life. And so I'm going to encourage you, use this stuff. Reach out to Jim. He's a great guy. Go visit him at Spear. And if you can get in his study club, maybe you can sneak me in there too. They won't let me in. So um, but <laughs> keep sending us suggestions for things you guys want to see. We're lining them up. Um, and until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy your day. 